Respect the process is back. I don't even know what week we're on, but we are back. I'm just amazed that we're back. I know. Each week they keep Every, the doors locked. It's there's not something that says closed or I did have to fight that elevator to this. open. Oh, I it'll happen. I took the wrong I get they told me once I got up here that I took the wrong elevator because you they kinda pry the doors open. That was a closet. It no, was. It was not an elevator. I would explain a lot of things. It would. Um, okay, Alabama football. Mm -hmm. Are we back to accepting boring wins? Will we take anything we can get? Dang right yeah. we will. I won't speak <laughs> for everybody else, but I will. Uh, yeah, and that was, that was a boring game only because of what happened in the span of a minute. That's a 17 to 10 ball game. Mm -hmm. There's about, what, four minutes to go in the first half or less when all of a sudden you look up and... 17 to 10, third down in a couple. Bama gets a procedure penalty on Amari Nyblack. Back him up five, now third seven. Throw it to Amari Nyblack. First down, boom, from there, score, pick, touchdown again. And instead of it being potentially 17 to 17 at half, it is 31 to 10. And people started looking to watch, going, oh, it's 10 o'clock. Wait a second. But, you know, if we go home now, we can make early church tonight. That's right. So they were getting out of there, and it was a lot less loud. And I thought Bama played really, really well. They would have been nice to add a touchdown in the second half, but Will Reichert's automatic right now. He's fantastic. So you never let them feel like they had hope, even when they scored to start the second half, to make it 31-17, put them away, got points, and – just kept them at arm's distance the rest of the way. This feels like kind of the first time since they played Texas that people aren't talking about Alabama this week and what's wrong. They're more focused on the next game. Yeah, I agree. I think that's exactly right. And it's two things. One is Bama's gotten a lot fixed. Bama did a lot of things well. Um, they look like Alabama. Also, people understand A&M's good. Mm -hmm. and, and you're able to talk about the matchup itself and what happens if both play well, strength versus strength, all of those type things. And a lot of that tends to favor A&M right now, but I don't think Alabama's going to fail to show up. I think they'll be ready to go and excited to play on Saturday. It is going to be interesting to see what the offense does. It, having watched Milrow this past week, I mean, he was 10 of 12. Yeah. Obviously, they did not throw the ball out when you look at that line. Right. A and M seemingly would stack the box to prevent them from continuing to have success in the run game. So it will be interesting to see what Tommy Reese is able to dial up this week. Well, it's two things. It's the the scheme part of it, but it's also can you protect Jalen when you do have to throw and right. you're going to have to throw because A and M is one of the best in the country in pass uh, in pressures on the quarterback. But Alabama is unfortunately stats wise one of the worst in terms of protecting the quarterback. They, they've got to give him some time because you're going to have to throw it at least a little bit to take pressure off the run game, which is getting better and better, but you've got to be able to take some pressure off of it. And that's going to be a huge question mark in this game. It's going to be a homecoming for Milrow, though. I mean, having yeah, grown up true. just down the street from College Station mm -hmm. and, and Katy, Texas. So I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that he will probably have family and it will be, and having originally committed to Texas, I mean, he's yeah. going to be back in his home state and be the starting quarterback for the University of Alabama. And that's special for all those kids. I don't care yeah. where home is. When you go back and you play in front of the home folks, there's there's a lot on you. There's a lot of pressure. Um, you know, a couple of picks against Texas in that game, but a lot of other things that he did really well. <laughs> we all know that it only took about a week and a half later before coaches realize, okay, we know what he's not, mm -hmm. but we also know what the other guys are not, right. and that's better than him. So staying with Milrow, trying to get things better in terms of play calling towards his strengths, and also better decision making from him. We saw some signs of that. He made one throw that he got away with. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. It was one back across his body. I look, I look back on the replay on television, there were three DBs or three defenders in the area. I think of Nye Black who made, made the catch, maybe it wasn't him, but made the grab. And I'm going, 
holy cow, that's that's not one they recommend because it's yeah. back across his body. <laughs> yeah. Three defenders, yeah. one receiver. It's not how it was drawn up. But it's a perfect throw. It's a tough throw, and it was right on the money. Hit him right in the numbers, and that had to be a lift for his confidence. I know it was a lift for mine from a confidence standpoint in it because that's a big-time throw. It's not one down the field. We've seen that. Those are great. But this is one with a defender hanging on him. Had to Had to make the throw with – all sorts of stuff going on around him and had to really thread a needle, and he did. That was good to see. Another massive issue that we don't, no one wants to be talking about this at this point in the season, but so when, why you, are you bringing it up? when you take a, you when you take a snap in the ear hole. Well, that'll do it. Are we talking personal life? What's the uh, deal? We, we could, that, okay. that's a whole other show. I'm sorry. But um, Milro, the other day when uh, on Monday's yes. press conference, Saban took a good seven seconds. Mm-hmm. Take a deep breath. Before he responded. Milrow, when asked, took ownership of it, which is a great leader and a great quality that you're looking for. Mm-hmm. But obviously, I mean, something's got to give at this point. Well, and I will say, communicating there is very tough with the oh, bells I know, I know. and all that stuff. But you, you still can't, it still can't happen. There were two plays, and I think it was that one and maybe the punt just prior to that drive where Bama was really fortunate to get the football back. That mm-hmm. could have gone very different, and that game maybe looks different, certainly at halftime, if that doesn't go Bama's way, or one or both of those don't go Bama's way. So uh, that being said, they got to get it fixed because it's not going to be any less loud, you know, with all the howdies and giggums that you'll get in College Station this weekend. No bells, but all the other stuff. It'll be loud. There's 100,000. They're swaying. It's... It's a tough place. Well, and it's uh, it, Kyle Field compared to playing in Starkville, where they had you know sixty-one thousand. Yeah. Now you're going to Kyle Field, so there are going to be forty thousand more people there. there and is. it's a weird place with a lot of weird traditions. You got your overalls, you got your military uniforms, which I'm not sure which branch of the service they're in to begin with. The twelfth man. It's just, it, it's a weird place. You left to play. off the milkmen that they try to pass off as cheerleaders, but well, I, you, I, you're taking me down this road and you don't have to go there. I do. I know. Now they'll be coming after me, but I don't care. Um, yeah, it's different. They've got, they've got a lot of traditions. It's a tough place to play. That's the, that's the bottom well, I had line. A, I had a great line I'm going to use. Go ahead. When, no, when oh. they're not rolling tape, remind me to, to come back to my line. They have a lot of traditions. No, it's okay. I've got to go there and okay. survive. Fine. But it's great. You're going to want to hear okay. it. So anyway, a lot of traditions, but um, it comes down to who's making plays. Yeah. And Bama has done a better job of that historically in this series unless Johnny Manziel is on the field, and that only happened once. Now, they're not bad at quarterback right now. You know, Johnson's a good player, mm-hmm. even though he's a backup. But he's a, the, the interesting thing about him, he's a backup. He's a former starter. He's a former starter that right. transferred, was the backup, is now playing. So he's got some SEC experience. He's cool under he, center. He's a starting quarterback. Yeah. He just happened to not be the first one out there before. You're right, and he's good. He almost made a couple of big mistakes in the game against Arkansas, mm-hmm. didn't, and survived it. Probably going to be better this week. Uh, Bama's got their hands full, but it is it is loud. It's a tough environment. I know this started off talking about the snaps, but communication for Alabama is going to be tough. But mm-hmm. they got to make it tough for A&M's offense, too, and they're going to have to do it without noise. they got to find a way to just get there yeah. and, and create – havoc in the backfield. What's interesting about this game is it's not the biggest game in the country. It's not even the biggest game in Texas this week because you've got Oklahoma and Texas yeah. coming into the conference next year. Right. Uh, a lot of eyes are going to be on that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think to further the legitimacy of Texas, you know, it doesn't hurt Alabama necessarily for Texas to keep winning. Um, but the interesting thing between a and m and Alabama, both four and one teams. This one, the winner Matters. of this one, controls their destiny. They do, and uh, gives them a chance to get back to the SEC championship. You're right, and obviously, I know you know this. Uh, 
it may not be the biggest game in the state. It's not going to matter to either side, and it's not going to affect preparation. It's not going to affect noise yeah. level. It's not going to affect execution. It will affect some of the conversation by people that do what we do for a living. It will still be, I think, when all said and done, maybe the best game that takes place. It's got that type of chance. I hope it doesn't go down to the last play like it did last year. If it does, I hope we get the same result that Alabama finds a way to win and we can get out of here again. And uh, it would be fun to see Alabama get that, especially on the road. But I said it two or three times already. They got their hands full. A&M's good. But I think Alabama's best is good enough to get them. Define the relationship between Saban and Jimbo Fisher Ooh. right now. Yeah, we're we're not we're not confined to FCC. No, we're not. Okay. Jimbo uh, is a heck of a coach. I remember when he was Terry Bowden's quarterback at Sanford. I was a kid, teenager, um, who was excited that Sanford was starting their program back. My brother had played at Sanford in the early '70s. Mm -hmm. One of my earliest memories. With that. So it was a big deal that Sanford had brought the program back and brought a guy in that was capable of winning. Yeah. And Jimbo was great. Great assistant. Uh, really good assistant under Nick Saban. There are a lot of guys in the coaching business that will tell you, because they've told me, Jimbo Fisher owes his career to Nick Saban. If Nick Saban doesn't give Jimbo Fisher an opportunity, I think it was at LSU. He was out of coaching. Whatever staff he was on, they were, they were gone. He didn't have a job. Nick Saban gave him an opportunity. And Jimbo's a heck of a coach. Mm -hmm. But he's also one that, from a lot of people, that know him far better than I feel like he's extremely jealous and is known to pout and whine more than most. And if he feel like, feels like he's not getting the attention that he deserves, he will be a guy that whines and pouts a little more. We've seen that. And that doesn't have anything to do with the outcome of the game. Right. But it does affect a lot of the conversation leading up to it. It's led to some at least on the surface, hard feelings between the two. It's a shame because Jimbo helped Nick Saban win some games as an assistant. Nick Saban did far more for him, though. And from people that were, were in the room at the SEC head coaches meeting, the first time they were together after the... Back and forth. The back and forth that... Uh, you know, next rounds, Jim Dunaway was the MC for, and Nate Oates was, was right there, and, and Coach said what he said. And then Jimbo, against the direct orders of the league commissioner and his athletic director, mm -hmm. went into a press conference and ran his mouth and made it where people that weren't even on Nick Saban's side took Nick Saban's side just because of the way Jimbo handled it. I say all of that to say Nick Saban went into that coach's meeting and was the bigger man, apologized, shook his hand, and handled it the way a man should. That's not always the way Jim, Jimbo Fisher has handled things, and that's why it's so easy for Jimbo Fisher to be a villain. That's interesting because you also look at this game and you're thinking, okay, they, they're 4 and one They're unranked. Um, I would think that there's also a little chip on their shoulder, and you also you you mix in Bobby Petrino. Sure, yeah. Go for there's a lot of elements to this game. You know, you know it's volatile when Petrino's down the list of people that you talk about that are involved. Uh, it's because he's getting his resume together. It's exactly always right. applying or a hatchet. Yeah, for Jimbo's back, uh, he's he's been known to do that. So here's what I would say in regards to, to all of that. This is setting up perfectly. Not saying it'll happen. I'm just saying though, it is setting up for A&M to play like absolute garbage. Mm -hmm. Because 
the way Jimbo's teams have done in the past. When you give up on them, they tend to play really well. When you start to really believe in them, such as the Miami game earlier in the year, something goes haywire. People were expecting, I was one of them, if Bama had scored 90 on Texas A&M last year and had the ball across midfield with a minute to go, I'd have been begging Nick Saban to go hurry up right there. I, everybody wanted, Punch they didn't want in. blood, they wanted the plasma, they wanted any and everything that was attached to it. They wanted more than blood and were very fortunate to come out with just a win. I think this is a year where people feel like A&M's got a real chance, mm -hmm. and I hope they lay an egg. I think they may. We'll see. Uh, but what a lot of fans saw last week, for Alabama fans, I should say, saw that last week, was what they wanted to see when they saw Angry Saban. Yeah. They finally saw Angry Saban They again. saw Angry Saban, but here's the only thing I would say about that. Well, there's two things I'll say about it. One, saw. I got a feeling Angry Saban was there on the sidelines the previous couple of weeks or more when the moment called for right. it. But you know this from being in the TV business. It's a matter of when does the camera get switched? When does the director switch to a shot of, of Saban? Is he losing his mind or has he already gotten back under control by the time they go to a shot of him? That's a real thing because people are watching at home determining their opinion of what Coach Saban's attitude and behavior is based solely on when the director says, you know, yeah. take three, camera three, or whatever the terminology is. That's what they see. The other part of that is, early in the year, Nick Saban knew the psyche of this team probably right. couldn't yeah. handle being gnawed on the way he is known for gnawing, okay? especially the quarterbacks. So Jalen Milrow in week one, two, maybe even week three, he's in there at quarterback. He makes a mistake. Nick Saban jumps all over him. The first thing probably in Jalen Milrow's mind is, uh-oh, I'm coming out. Right. Uh-oh, I'm losing my job. Uh-oh, Ty Simpson's getting loose. It's human nature. That's the way it would be. It's clear now this is Jalen Milrow's team. This is Jalen Milrow's job. Now you can go gnaw on him. Now you can go coach him and not worry that he's worried about, is the other shoe going to drop? Just go play. Listen to what I'm saying. Get better. Well, and you said that uh, in another show when we were talking about it's not always the right time to yeah. jump on them. Right. Sometimes they need love. They need to be loved. And right. then other times, yeah, it, this is the time to go and chew somebody's ass out. Yeah, and there's nobody better at it than him. <laughs> And he does enjoy, he does enjoy being able to brag on Miss Terry for yeah. getting it right. But, yeah. and you made a great point, and I've, I've told other people this, that when you said, you know, when the world's against Alabama, he's the mm -hmm. first one to stand up and, and say, I got you. Right. Um, and interesting, do you think, and there's, there's a couple schools of thought in it, losing early, and at this point, it looks like losing early is beneficial to Alabama versus losing late in the season. Obviously, you got more time to recover, recoup, however you want to say it. But at the same time, now let's let's not forget, Bama lost, but they lost to what may be the best team in the country. Exactly. Right yeah. Now. Texas may be playing the best football in the nation to date. They also have played Ole Miss and Mississippi State. Ole Miss showed against LSU; they're mm -hmm. not bad. You know, they showed they can score a lot of points, and Bama did a great job shutting them down. Mississippi State's going to get better, but Mississippi State's not an elite team, not in this league, not right now under Zach Arnett. So the better teams are coming. The, the best team may be still left on the schedule, the regular season schedule, is Saturday in College Station. So you've already played Texas. You know how great they are. Now you've got Texas A&M. That's your, that's your next really tough one. We don't really know about Tennessee. We don't really know about LSU, other than you know both are going to be good. And dear Lord, Auburn at Auburn at the end of the year, forget what and who they've yeah, been. Weird things happen there too. I've, I've seen them. So let's not, Bama's shown improvement. 
Bama's won two league games, and they've done it against. Uh, they've done it in a fashion that shows definite improvement as right. to who they are. Yeah. But I'm not getting size for another championship ring just yet, even if they win Saturday against A&M. But there's no doubt this is the best we have seen the Tide face since the Longhorns. And I get no one has the crystal ball except for the guys back there who prognosticate and Lance's locks. And That's all right. Those Lance has got it figured out. They know obviously a lot more than we do. But watching teams as we've gone week to week now, I mean, Georgia doesn't look unbeatable. Georgia looks beatable at sure times. Yeah. Um, I think everyone is kind of, it's starting to settle down now a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And the pieces of the puzzle are slowly starting to come in play. But I think Alabama fans can't help but, as you said, with Texas, the best thing for them is for Texas to keep winning. Bama's, I agree, Bama potentially mm -hmm. can be as good as anybody there is. You're right. Potentially, already what we've seen from Alabama, they could lose two to three more games. Well, and play up or down to the level of competition. Which they can do that. Unfortunate. And, you know, there were, there were times that you would look at Alabama and go, nobody's going to stay within three touchdowns of them. Okay. But those are historically great teams, too. You're, it, you're foolish to think that's going to be year in and year out. And it does go back to what we talked about before. Kelly, some of these guys that were backups at Alabama the last few years are starters at other schools now. Right. Everybody's good, dealing yeah, with that. That's a good point. You know, you except, watch, for except for Dabo. Except for Dabo. And here's to his point. I was about to, or to that point, I was about to go with one of his players. DJ Ungalale. God, I got that right. That's amazing. I'm, that I'm, wow. The best part is that I said DJ Ungalale and then go yeehaw, yeehaw afterwards. Yeah, but, kind of like yeah. Speedy Gonzalez. Anyway, yeah. DJ, now at Oregon State, doing a really good job mm -hmm. there. He's an example. They've got a good quarterback at, at Clemson, but a guy who some were touting as a Heisman candidate couldn't win the job on his own campus. Now he's a starter in a pretty good league right. for yeah. one more year. It's one more good, it's a good league. This one, uh, this is a, an indication of what you see, in my opinion, almost all over the country. Your frontline guys may be about as good as they've ever been, but your twos are now guys that would have been threes and are gonna be great players because that's all Alabama signs anymore, but they're just not as developed. They're not as experienced as they've been. So in a, instead of having an experienced backup to move in and, and take over for somebody that's banged up, now you got a kid that's a freshman or maybe a quarter step down in talent mm -hmm. from what you had in years past. Getting, getting back to A&M, how would you grade them in, in the SEC since they, they've been in the league now for... Overall? Yeah. I mean... I feel pretty comfortable saying B to B minus. Yeah. You know, they've never been, they've always been respectable. They've always been top half, but they've never been elite. Mm -hmm. And that's not, that's not a knock on them. And I mean, it's just reality of, yeah. of who they are. Are they a, um, a bad program? Absolutely not. Are they in the same breath with Texas and Alabama, Oklahoma? No, they're not. The record shows that, but it's not a bad record. Doesn't mean that they can't have years where they are. It doesn't mean you shouldn't strive to be better. Doesn't mean they made a bad hire in Jimbo Fisher to come in. Got won a national championship. Seemed like yeah. he was the guy. Did you overpay? Absolutely you did. But somebody else would have paid. LSU would have paid, mm. but LSU wouldn't have gotten as good a coach as they've got right now. Regardless of what happens, I think Brian Kelly's a better coach than Jimbo Fisher. Um, it's it's interesting to see how this is all going to play out for Jimbo. But for Texas A&M, if they don't get the brass ring, or in this case the SEC championship ring this year, you tell me when it's going to come. Because here comes Texas, mm -hmm. here comes Oklahoma, Right. Both look like they're going to be running into the league rather than limping into the SEC. 
Bama's not going anywhere. Georgia, Auburn, Florida will be better. Tennessee's the best that they've been in a long time, even though they're not phenomenal. South Carolina's better. Uh, by the way, you're probably going to ultimately get Clemson and either Florida State or Clemson and whoever coming into the league sooner rather than later. It's going to get easier. a and M's a and better step through quick because that window's closing for them. Well, they play the role of the pissed off little brother very well. Are you going to go to a college station and cover for me? No, you're good. You you're good. You're good. Yeah. They won't recognize you. are fine. They won't recognize They're me. Fine. You're exactly They're right. Um, traditionally, Nick Saban has been, I'm not going to say hard to reach, but his access has been limited to members of the media and other things. When he agreed to, to do his weekly segment on the Pat McAfee show, mm -hmm. um, I remember I was talking to my dad and my husband, and they just they couldn't believe it. And I said, he's not trying to appeal to you. Mm -mm. This is by no means an appeal to really anyone over, I'd say, maybe the age of 40. This has to be a strategic move on his part to adapt or die. His, his part or Jimmy Sexton's, neither of which is a bad move, but it, either way, it's for Nick Saban to do what you're talking about, and that is to appeal to a younger demographic, show that he's still got it. He does. Nick Saban can... It's showing a side of him that really is him. Mm -hmm. It's just normally not shown outside of a recruiting visit. Yeah. Or okay. certain more private circles. Right. But people that are around him know him. They know absolutely. He can carry... If he couldn't carry on that type of conversation that you got to carry on with McAfee, he wouldn't be doing that. He wouldn't put himself in that spot if he didn't know he could manage it. Even though he knows he needs to be in that circle, mm -hmm. he's comfortable in that circle. I have no or doubt. Or capable in that circle. Well, if you're capable and comfortable talking to 18-year-olds. No doubt. And, you know, and I'm going to say shoot, 16 through 24. It always has been. I know we we're talking 15, 20 years ago when he did uh, The Blind Side, the yeah. Michael Orr yeah. story. Because I love that quote when the mom was like, I find him very, very, attractive. very, very attractive, very charming, very handsome. I can't, it was one of those words that you're just, Sandra Bullock. Yeah. Uh, let me just tell you, if Sandra Bullock ever, even in a script, referred to me as attractive, if you don't think I'd have that on a continuous mm -hmm. loop all the time. Anyway. You're like, just go ahead. That's, that's as good as it's going to get. Uh, that's as, that's um, as good George as... George Costanza has left the building. What was, what was my point before this? Nick Saban told the the uh, producers and directors, you know, they had this script and he kind of, he looked at it and then he goes, I'm going to make some notes. Why don't you just let me do this like I would with mm -hmm. a recruit? Why don't you just let me talk to him the way I would to a recruit and you keep your little script and I, and that's what they did. And when you see that, if it works, it's him. Yeah. It's him. And it gives people the real insight to it. And he knew that if he did it that way, that Sandra Bullock would go. I find him very attractive. No, I just, it's an interesting. That, it, that alone makes him a legend as far oh, as I'm concerned. Not Sandra Bullock, it was Leanne Tui, but, but still. still. Uh, because <sighs> along those lines, when, when McAfee joined Game Day, my husband's like, I mean, I don't get it. And I was like, it's not meant he for talking you to, to you. get. That's right. I was like, you're already watching and you'll continue watching. Ain't talking they to you. They are trying to bring in a younger demographic yeah. And it truly is part of the adapt or die. And we go back to talking about Adabo Sweeney is not going to, at this point, not going to jump in on the transfer portal. Um, you know, if you're going to continue to run a successful football program, there are yeah. certain things that you're going to have to do. You do. You don't have, and, and here's the thing, and again, it's part of why Nick Saban is the best ever, mm -hmm. certainly in this generation. He understands how to adapt. Nick Saban hadn't changed for a minute. Got a who birthday coming is, up this month, I know. He, does. He, he hasn't changed for a minute who he is and what he believes. The manner in which you arrive at that, though, can change and adapt. And he is. He's 
he's not given up on what he thinks it takes to win. But how you arrive at that, yeah, it can change. I'll give you a prime example. I would have been knocked blind by my parents if I had asked why yes. when they told me to do something. Yes. Um, and my older son knew that was, I didn't really have a good answer, but that's how I was taught. That's what he knew. Yeah. He didn't ask why. He understands now that kids and players often do ask the question why. And it's not challenging the, his authority. It's not um, doubting his authority. It is more of an analytical approach. And truly, they want to understand. He's allowed himself to understand that and adapt that. And that's one of the reasons why he's as, as successful as he is. Right. They don't see it. Not as a sign of disrespect, right. but just the way it has evolved. Right. It is part of it. And again, it's all in how you say it. Yeah. But he, man, he is amazing. Because again, what is at his, at his core of who he is and what he believes, none of that's changed. But the path to it can change a little bit. And that's why ultimately the destination is still the same and that's in a championship more often than not. I've got a theory that we'll talk about some and we'll talk we'll talk in another show about Okay. I've got a theory about him. You mean what, we're gonna get another show? I I'm gonna keep showing up it's each week. A miracle. Even if there's not a camera, it's I'm a gonna miracle. keep showing up each week and just sit here and talk. That's cool. My family has said I probably have done that for years. Um, where do you see the game best from? Do you see it from the sideline, the press box, or on a TV or a monitor? Oh, press box. Press box? Yeah, because I can go, I can let my eyes go where I want them to go. I'm just curious, because you've, yeah. you've, you've called, worked, and seen games from every angle. I have, yeah. We did, we did games off TV monitors. Mm -hmm. uh, with it being in Fayetteville, and I'm sitting in Bryant Denny. What about baseball? Do you see baseball uh, best? Oh, I, I really would struggle to call a game off TV monitor for baseball. Okay. Exclusively off the monitor. Too many moving pieces. Yeah. Too many moving pieces. Now, to to do it justice, I've got to be able to see the field. Yeah. Um, football's the same way. Basketball's the same way. Sidelines for football, you get a, it's really important, I think, to have someone down there. Yeah. Because they can give you a perspective, especially if it's a former player. They can give you a perspective that just means so much. Um, that I can't give ever, but especially from the booth. I think another piece of that is they can give you attitude they can actually look into the guy the eyes of some guys and mm -hmm. see mood and relay that especially for radio but for me to be able to see the big picture to describe it in a, from a play-by-play -play perspective there's nothing like sitting on the 50 or close to it where you've got the vantage point best seats in where the you house can see it. it's it is great i've also done them you know from the corner of the end zone um if, for instance we're at the Jor uh Jerry World, you're, at, you're oh, in yeah, Dallas. Oh yeah, in Dallas, yeah. You're in Dallas, where the home radio booth is, where Brad Sham, the longtime voice of the Cowboys, operates from. It's a phenomenal booth. It's a suite. I don't doubt it. It's great it. to have, mm. but it's positioned, I think, either with the pylon or actually in the end zone. Okay. You're so far down. Ordinarily, that's horrible, except, as you well know, They've got a video board that's 20 yards high yeah. and runs from the 20 yard line to the 20 yard line. It looks like you've got it. And when I'm doing play by play, I'm cheating. I'm looking at both. So I can see it off the board because it's so clear. Yeah. And I can see things, especially on the other end of the mm. field, better than I can yeah. right in front of me. But I'm able to get a big field perspective 
but also look up top and get the picture there. I'm never touching the binoculars unless there's somebody injured and for whatever reason they don't have the camera on them. But man, it's that's a that's where you really get the best of both worlds. Do you have a favorite place to call games from? O outside of Bryant Denny, which I know is your home base. It is. And it has to be one of your favorite but would you have a favorite stadium? It would ha it would be um, AT and T Stadium. It'd yeah. be Jerry World. Just because of the video board atmosphere set up, it's fantastic. Best press box food. Ooh, I have a Lord. favorite. And I would I would literally go hungry a day before I got down to Baton Rouge because I would yeah. eat my weight in bread pudding. I understand. Tell you what, oh. they fed us well in Starkville last week because the capper, it was, uh, I think I had some barbecue. No, I take that back. There we had uh, chicken alfredo. Oh, okay. Chicken alfredo, well done, but the capper was the ice cream from the dairy on campus at Mississippi See. State and there's like seven different flavors in those in those freezer you know those cups yeah. like you got in elementary school oh, yeah including the wooden sticks oh you had about seven different flavors to pick from and in the cooler and I'm in yeah Eddie Fo I've told you the Eddie Fogler line on here right the former I don't think Wake so. Forest Georgia Tech coach I don't think he so. goes you show me a room full of poorly dressed men and a free meal and I'll show you a media gathering that's exactly it that's Eddie Fogler uh, men or women usually the women are better dressed God, I mean, Eddie. yeah but that was Eddie's line 20 years ago and I said wow Eddie what a shock that you didn't have a better relationship with the media but it was a spot-on comment that especially when you and I got started oh my gosh it's that drove me now. nuts are you kidding they people be up there like they hadn't eaten had months it was like a, like a three-legged cat is. they were just still is oh my gosh that's probably the only time I Hogs ever at the trough man I ever lost my mind on like a uh, different video ever on satellite truck operators or when they were too busy fighting for the chip witch or you know their ice cream cone and I miss <coughs> I miss my window or I miss my live shot because they were up in trying the press box because they were trying to get the warm cookies. I was like, really? Was it good? Was it worth it? Was it worth it? It's all about the warm cookies. But I'll tell you, no, I, I always liked Baton Rouge. That was one of my favorite. How bad? Um, some Not good bad. bread pudding. Okay, so 2.30 Saturday. 2.30 Saturday, 11.30 airtime on yep. the Crimson Tide Sports Network. Uh, podcast for me uh, on my social media Chris platforms. Stewart. ChrisStewartOnline.com is the website, but you'll find the links there. But at C. Stewart Sports for X or Twitter Jesus. X or whatever. Um but also, uh, we make sure we refeed this and yeah, hope you'll all the things. take this and share it. Show your and friends and family. Do all that just, stuff. You know, before the game, after the game. Uh, but no, travel safe. You leave in Friday, Friday? morning, 6 a.m. out of Birmingham. Woo! Oh, you got to love that. Nice and early. Oh, uh, yeah. It so, could be driving. It could be worse. Could be it driving. Could be, Have done that. Yeah. Don't want to do that. So flying to. Houston with Tom Stipe, Butch Owens, and then we will drive on up to College Station and be there for the weekend. Yeah. Hopefully enjoying some good uh, brisket on Friday yeah. and or Saturday night after a win. Because they, don't they do like pep rallies and bonfires and all that? They do a lot They of have, stuff. okay, they have yell practice. Yeah, they have yell, that's right. They you do have, I think, yelling. a bonfire, but the milkmen will be leading yell practice on Friday night at midnight. Ooh. Unnerving. Boy, if I'd gone, if I'd gone there, I would have, you know, had dinner at Bible study to go to Yale practice on a Friday night at midnight, and then quickly get back to Scripture, because that's what I would do on a Friday night. Um, as always, I ain't buying that as far as I never mind. We want to thank Chris Stewart for, My stop, pleasure. for stopping by, and we need to give him one good one before I, the weekend starts. Well, start. roll tide and God help you. How about that? Hey, exactly. So travel safe. Thank you. We will see you back here. Thanks for watching. Respect the process. And we'll see you all next week.